So the topic I was given by Pastor Travis and Pastor Craig to talk about is the weekend experience, the weekend experience. And I want to I frame that up real quick. The church is not a place. The church is not a building. Um, the church isn't even necessarily an experience. The Greek word ekklesia means the movement of God's people. So when two or more are gathered with the purpose of edifying, stirring up, encouraging, and growing the kingdom of God and experiencing him, that is an expression of the church. But in those moments, we experience what Jesus asked and wanted us to experience. And it traces all the way back, something we talked about last night, to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus, I'm not going to read a lot of scripture. We're going to get real practical here. But in Exodus chapter 19, it was the first assembly. Y'all, y'all know it as if you've seen Prince of Egypt or the Charlton Heston version when the God came down, Ten Commandments, you know, or what was that one with Mel Brooks when he comes down? I give thee the 15, 10 commandments. I love that scene. Um, but that was the first assembly. The, the nation of Israel, they were all together, and Moses went up on a mountain, and then fire and smoke came down from space. Like, we, we act like it's really, like, spiritual. We're like, fire came from the sky. Guys, if that happened today in any city, people would be like, ah, and like IG in it live, and we would be freaking out. And that's exactly what the nation of Israel did. They were like, what is happening? What is this? It was the most powerful thing, the craziest thing they'd ever seen. And then Moses came down, and this is what he said. A man met with God. And the people said, we want to do more of that. That was incredible. Can we gather and experience God as much as possible? And the church was born. And then Jesus came along and said, I'm building my new assembly where the Holy Spirit will be with you. And every time you gather with the intention of edifying each other and lifting up the word and presence of God and glorifying him and expanding his kingdom, he's going to do something special. And so what we get to do at our churches all across the world, what we get to do is create these gatherings. It's like we get to step on the Mount Sinai every seven days. And that's what's different. Jesus can meet you in your living room. He can do it. He can meet you in your car. But there is something different when God's people said, you know what? Different races, different places, different ethnicities, different ages, different genders. We are stepping in together with the intentional purpose of meeting with God. And so as I talk about the weekend experience, I'm going to get super practical because I, I'm, it's, this isn't a sermon. This is just going to be like things I've learned throughout the last decade and a half, two decades of you know, working in church and stuff I've learned by messing up, stuff I've learned from being around a lot of great churches. And some of it may apply to you, some of it may not. Most of you know how to put together a weekend experience where we encounter God. But my hope is out of 100% of this, 2% of it, you walk away and go, oh, that's going to change things or that's going to help things. So we're just going to jump right in. So with the weekend experience, i got four words that kind of rhyme because I grew up Southern Baptist. Um, <laughs> the four words are when it comes to the weekend experience, preparation, execution, distribution, and evaluation. I said kind of rhyme. They all got the T-I-O-N. Preparation, execution, distribution, and evaluation. When it comes to creating an experience where people are coming together in our context on a Sunday, some of us meet on different days, some of us meet at different times, but I just want to talk about that Sunday experience when we're coming together and some ways we can hopefully make it more powerful. One of the things I wrote down is we're calling this a weekend experience. This is an experience we get to create every Sunday, every Wednesday when we gather. It is an experience. And one of the things I wrote down here is about the whole experience. We've heard it said, the experience church starts in the parking lot. I don't know if you know that. We were talking, Chris Brown and I were talking just yesterday. Your average guest, the person that just shows up, decides if they like the experience within the first seven minutes of driving up or walking up. So what that means is if it's a bad parking experience, you have a grumpy greeter and a, you know, long kids check in before they've ever heard a note or a word from the sermon, they don't want to be there. So the experience starts in the parking lot. Overflow. That's why we want a new parking lot in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Our parking lot needs help. Um, But like, I mean like the gravel. It just, we got it. We're saving up. I'm not meaning the people. The people are amazing. But But it starts, so just asking yourselves, and that's on a Wednesday night too. If you're a student ministry, the experience starts out there. 
The experience doesn't start when they walk in here. So these are things we know, but I just want to remind us, are we being intentional with the way people are coming in? Because y'all know what it's like to want to go somewhere and you can't get in the door or there's a bouncer or there's a long line or it costs more than you thought and it ruins the meal at the restaurant or it ruins the experience at the theme park because you couldn't even get in and you're hot and you're sweaty. Like even little things, like one of my favorite things is to put music in the parking lot. You put music in the parking lot, you will immediately change people's attitudes. It'll put a smile on their face, their ears will perk up, they'll be like, what's that? I'm walking into a party, let's go. Little things make a big difference. One of my favorite things I learned from Pastor Chris and a few other pastors I got to serve with that are campus pastors, I love it when it rains when people come to church. I love it when it rains when people come to church. Some of you are like, what? First off, rainy weather is good church weather. When it's really sunny outside, people are like, oh, I'm going to the beach. Um, and when it's really stormy, people are like, uh, I can't go to church. It's stormy. You want to go to the movies? Like, people are ridiculous. But, man, there was no laughter at that. I don't <laughs> mean it. That was sarcasm. But I love when it rains because that's a chance to increase someone's experience. As the lead pastor or as a campus pastor, we would grab umbrellas and wait for people to get out of their car. And as soon as they opened the door, we'd show up and walk them in. And they'd be like, oh, thank you. My favorite was when it was a first time guest. You come in, shake the umbrella off, welcome or whatever. And then when it comes time for the sermon, that lead pastor steps on stage and it was the guy that walked them in with an umbrella. That experience changes everything. It doesn't matter if the weather's good, the weather's bad. You can find a way to change someone's entire MO, mode of operation, as soon as they step on the parking lot. Pray over the parking lot. Make sure it's anointed. So my point is, it is an experience. So when it comes to preparation, you got to prepare an experience. It doesn't just happen. And so I'm going to dig in on this one. Proverbs 24, 27 says this. Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. The... The, the writer there, Solomon, is saying, if you don't do what you need to do and you do what you prefer to do, you will starve. If you don't, back then, if they didn't toil the field and they started with their home, they would die. He's saying there are things you need to focus on first in order to make the house in order. And so when it comes to preparing here, I'm, like I said, I'm just going to kind of read through this list. I wrote this. What experience would you want to invite your friends, family, and coworkers to? When we're creating a weekend experience, when we're all part of this, are you psyched? I'm not saying like you guilt tripped into inviting people to church, like, oh, I want them to get to Jesus, they don't go to hell, so I should invite them to church. I mean, are we psyched to be here on a Sunday? Are we excited? Like my wife and I will talk, and I'll catch myself sometimes. I'll say like, man, I got to, I got to write this sermon, I got to do this, and she'll catch me. She'll go, got to? You mean you get to? And I'm like, thank you, Holy Spirit wife. Like, it's amazing. Like, we get to be here. But ask yourself that question. If you're not psyched to be at church on Sunday, why? And if you have any contribution to the experience, make it something you would be psyched to be at. Because if you're not psyched to be at it, you're not going to invite people. If you're not going to invite people, they're not going to be excited if they ever stumble in. But if you are excited to be here and you've created something you can't wait to step into, then you won't have to tell people when to invite. They will invite. And when people come, you'll be so excited that they're about to experience what you enjoy. Are you excited to invite people? And not people. It's really easy to invite strangers. Your mama, your daddy, your sister, your co-worker that you sit next to in the cubicle every day. Most of you are church workers, but y'all get what I'm saying here. Those are those people like, oh, what if they come and they don't like it? Is it going to be awkward? The experience we're creating on a Sunday should be so good that that's not even a question in our minds. Because they get to experience God in the gathering of his people. So again, just asking these questions. Would I come if I wasn't saved? Would I come if I wasn't on staff? Would I come every Sunday? Would I cancel plans to be in God's house? How high of a priority is it? Is it that good of an experience? And if it, it's not, how do we get it there? I wrote this down. What's your why? Why do we plan a weekend experience? Do you know why? You ever stop and ask, like, why do I go to church every Sunday? Why do we do this? Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. The Bible teaches us if we neglect coming together, we are more susceptible to the enemy and his attacks. If he's a roaring lion, one of the number one ways an enemy takes out a prey is to isolate it. So if we want to be taken down by the enemy, don't come to church. Don't gather with his people. But did you catch why it said we gather? It said the whole reason we gather on a Sunday, or one of the main reasons, is to stir one another up for love and good works. 
Stir, and then another translation says spur. Spur one another up on for love and good works. Both of the, one is stir like a pot, so everybody's comfortable and seated, and it's going, nope, we're going to create some friction to heat things up. And the other one is an equestrian term, a horseback riding term, spur. What does it mean to spur a horse? It means to cause the horse pain and discomfort so that it reaches its potential. That's what we're supposed to do when we gather. Some of you are like, whoa, 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 wait. Church, a part of church is to cause me discomfort and maybe even a little pain so that I reach my potential for Christ to stir and spur one another on. If you go to church every Sunday for a year and you're comfortable all 52 days, find a new church. There should be something that is said or saying that makes you go, oh, that's convicting, right? So when we're planning these gatherings, are we remembering our why? That's not saying be obnoxious or rude every Sunday because I'm supposed to make you uncomfortable. It's saying, are we planning experience that stir the environment, that spur people, that they come out of church on a Sunday like a pinball on a pin machine, pinball machine, like ready to run at Holland, ready to run at Benton Harbor, ready to run at Kingston, like are we creating experiences like that? What's our why? That's our why. I wrote in this, why are we supposed to gather? And I put, because we're supposed to, duh, but why? It's to stir and spur. This is how I write my notes. The next thing when it comes to preparation, I wrote this down. Who's your target? Who's your target? Have you ever thought about that? Some of you are like, my city, no. <laughs> like, that's, that's good, yes. The target is everyone in Holland. The target is everyone in Michigan. The target, Matthew 28, is everyone in the world. But Turin has been specifically equipped to reach a certain demographic in Grand Rapids. Everyone is welcome, but there is a target for the church, there is a target for a series, and there is even a target for certain weekends. Who is your target, and are we being intentional with the experience we're creating to actually target our target? I'll give you an example here. Let, well, yeah, I'll go ahead and go to it. Um, at Zeal, I'll, I'll use this example. Zeal was basically started by Omar and Lizanne Azan. Um, they asked me to come be a part of a vision that God had given them for a life-giving church down in Kingston. And the heartbeat of Zeal, we call it a church for Kurt. A church for Kurtz. Lizanne has a brother, and... Um, he was up in Canada, he moved down to Jamaica, ripped dude, bodybuilder, tattoos, earrings, like good looking dude, came down to Jamaica, and um, long story short, was trying to get his life together, been through some stuff, and he went to church after church, and because he had tattoos and earrings, and he dressed a certain way, church after church, he felt like he wasn't welcome. Even if it was just the sideways glances and the looks, even, you know, if it was, hey, you know, I don't know anybody to sit with, and Kurt ended up taking his life. And one of the things that Lizanne said to me when she first met me was, I just wish there was a church for Kurt. Because God knows what would have happened in his life. And so at Zeal, Kurt's our target. We know who we are going after. You give me that 25 to 45-year-old male that is just trying to get laid and paid, and I want to create an experience that introduces him to a Jesus that changes his entire world, and no matter what he looks like or what he's done, he feels welcome there. So every sermon I write, every video we make, every graphic, we're thinking about a Kurt. Now, we will, for Mother's Day, we're going to honor the mamas, right? Like, we'll do our thing. For Christmas, we're, it'll be Christmassy and all that. But nine times out of ten, we're going for our target there. So ask the question, lead pastors. Ask the question, churchgoers and staff members. Who is our target? Do you know? Who's your target? Like another great example, like down at Overflow. You know, what I love about Overflow is we are a very diverse church from Michigan. You got a lot of white people. got a lot of black people. got a lot of Hispanic people. And, and you walk into Overflow and you kind of feel it. It's like, oh, this is awesome. And we got to know that half of our population in Benton Harbor doesn't look like me. And so that means, yeah, we can celebrate 4th of July, but we also going to raise up Juneteenth. You know what I mean? Because our target is this community, and that's an important holiday for them. Who is your target? Do you know that? And are we creating experiences that actually appeal to the target? If you're fishing, you're going to use the bait for the fish that you're trying to catch. So just thinking through who your target is. And does your team and your leaders know that? If you're at Central, do you know who the target is? Have you, have you asked Craig, do, do, do you know? If you're student ministry, is there a specific target? Is there a specific school? Is there a demographic that you feel? Do you know? 
Have you asked? And when you ask, like, how do you replicate that and let that ripple through the organization and what we're doing? Another thing I wrote down when it comes to prep or when it comes to preparation, I wrote down an old athlete term, practice like you play and play like you practice in every area, not just on the stage. We expect worship teams to practice, right? Can I get an amen? Raise your hand. Worship teams should practice. Amen. Only one hand. Thank you, honey. I'm so grateful for you. We're going to participate. Y'all, come on. All right. So we expect worship teams to practice. Side note on that, guys. I, I wrote this down, too. Sometimes you don't know what's possible until you see it. I, it, it frustrates me to know when I'll, 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 I've gotten a chance to be around a lot of churches and like worship teams will kind of be struggling. And I'll be like, hey, when do you rehearse? They're like, oh, we rehearse Sunday morning. It's hard to get people here, you know, during the week. And I'm like, yeah, is it? Um, and and it, it, here I say this, like I come from a context where we did seven services a weekend at one point, two on Saturday, five on Sunday in a 2000 seat auditorium. This wasn't because we only had 100 seats. It was, hey, we fill it, do it again. We fill it, do it again. In other words, maximize any and every environment God gives you. And when you maximize what God gives you, he'll grant you more. Parable of the talents. We all know that. And, and I'm not saying everybody has to do five services. I'm not saying everybody has to do seven services. But in, in six of the services, same band, same vocals. 90% of them are volunteers. They'd all show up and rehearse on Thursday night. Band would rehearse. Vocals would re rehearse. Saturday, they would show up at 1 o'clock. They would do two. They would do a sound check. They would do a run-through. Then they would do a dress rehearsal run-through. Then we would have service at 6. Then we would sit for an eval meeting for an hour after it and talk about it, which we're going to talk about in a second. Then they'd show up again at 8 a.m. Sunday morning, do it four times, go home and eat lunch, come back at 5 and do it again. Volunteers. Volunteers. We, we've heard this said before. Like, we don't have volunteer problems. We have a vision problem. If you can't get volunteers, it's not the volunteer issue. It's a vision issue. I've seen people do amazing, and it wasn't like this experience where the drummer's like, oh, I gotta go back again. If you're a musician, you know, I grew up playing drums. I love to play drums. Give me some sticks and cymbals. Let me play as many services as I can. I love it. Create an experience that people love and want to be a part of. We, but here's, here's my point. We expect the band to practice, to show up rehearse, to learn their tracks. Worship leaders, if they don't know their tracks when they show up, don't let them play. Like, I, that's my personal conviction. Because it's for God. It's for him. It's for him. I would even go this far. My wife hates this. She's a phenomenal worship leader. You'll see that in just a second. But I have this issue with lyrics. I don't like music stands, and I don't like lyrics. If Craig can memorize a 40-minute message, you can memorize verse, course, verse, course, bridge, course that you didn't even write. I know, right? That's hard. That's hard. But my point is just, are we ingesting it? Are we preparing? Are we putting it in our hearts so that way we can really give God our best? If somebody doesn't know the lyrics because stuff's going on in their lives, I'm not saying, like, crucify them. I'm just saying, where are we holding the bar? Because it's for him and his glory, not for ours. Kim's like, oh, Lord, you're coming on staff here? No. <laughs> I'm not this much of, like, a spiritual Nazi. I'm just saying, like, there is this, this bar that I think we can raise a little bit. But here's my last point, that practice like you play, play like you practice. We expect the, the pastors to practice their messages. We expect the worship leaders to come ready, knowing their chords and beats and lyrics. But do we practice kids check-in? Do we practice greeting? Do we practice ushering? Do we practice the kids' ministry worship experience the same way we expect them to do here? Kids are people, too. They need Jesus. Oh, they should get less because they're younger? No. Their salvation is in the balance, too. Right? So are we, are we holding the same standard of excellence there as we do here, as we do there? Yeah. I'm just asking, are we practicing? Are we putting that same amount of effort in across the board? And here's the reason, not to be religious and be like, oh, all right, we did all the work. The reason there's preparation is so there can be divine execution. You, when there's proper preparation in the execution, there can be relaxation. It's an entirely different experience when you know your sermon, when you know your lyrics, when you know your chords, when you know how to check kids in, then you can focus on the point of ministry, which is the people. But if you're so worried about getting the note right because you didn't do the practice, you can't focus on the people. Does that make sense? So the reason preparation is a huge part of a weekend experience is because the whole point of ministry is people. Don't miss the point. That's why we practice, so we can enjoy it when they show up. So we can be like, yeah. And also on that note, like, make practicing fun. Like, I had a great worship leader, and he was amazing through college, and he made every rehearsal a great time. I loved being there. 
Are we intentional even with the prep environments? And so when it comes to execution, I wrote, remember your why. When it comes time for us to gather, when it, when it, when it happens, why are we doing it? We're doing it because he's worthy of the effort. He's worthy of the worship. He's worthy of the praise. And they need to meet him. They need to meet him. That's why we're doing it. That's why we're doing it. And the, the reason I say remember the why, because then if you hit a bad note, it's okay. If the computers crash, it's okay. If there's no PowerPoint, it's okay. Because remember your why. We've done all we can. Now let's let God do what he does. And when it all goes out, when we remember our why, it can still be a divine experience. I wrote, remember the experiences in person, and nowadays, remember it's also online. Remember you're building an experience for people in the room and on the other side of the camera. By that, I mean, here's a couple quick tips. Um, communicators, anytime you're on stage, look at people in the room. But if the majority of your audience or even a percentage of your audience is on the other side of the camera, look at them. Talk to the camera, which is awkward. We're not trained to do that. No one teaches you that in seminary. If you're giving announcements, look at the room and then look at the camera. Look at it, because they're there too. And not, these are simple little things. Even when it comes to the way we direct, video guys, we can experience. The way we capture and show a worship experience is different from a sermon. A sermon is documentary style. We want to keep the pastor in the shot. We want to catch every move. We want to make sure we see all of it. Worship is an artistic expression. It's an entirely different way of shooting and directing. We want to cast people's gaze up. We want to inspire them to sing. We want to see them get louder wherever they're watching from. So the way we direct a video experience for a musical moment where we are worshiping and entering the throne room of the King of Kings should be entirely different from the way we capture a sermon with one person on stage. But do we think through it like that? The weekend experience, the people on the other side of the camera, the people on... You, by the way, video directors, you are more of a worship leader than people up here with a mic. Because 90% of the audience is looking at what you put on that screen, not who's on stage. So you're the worship leaders. You're telling us what to say, and you're showing us what to look at. You guys are the worship leaders. Sound engineers, you're the worship leaders. You are. Because guess what? We could play our hearts out, and you go, vroom. <laughs> Ten people hear us, right? You're the amplifiers. Like, oh, man, I could keep going on that. That's a whole other sermon. All right, I'll just keep it going. <laughs> Um, here's another one I wrote down. Countdowns are great, but countdown to what? Are we intentional with how a service or an experience starts? Are we intentional with how it starts? People remember how you make them feel in the beginning and in the end. Those are huge. Your first impression and your last impression. Like, we've all been to that church where they've kind of gotten cool and they put this countdown on the screen and they bought it off of the website that everybody buys their countdowns from and then it hits zero and the band's going like this. Oh, okay, okay. Um, hold on. Sorry, guys. Hey, who's, are y'all happy to be here? Yeah, we're glad you're here too. Um, hold on. What key are we in? Okay, guys, um, will y'all will y'all, will y'all stand up and... Um, like, again, I'm not trying to be mean. Why, this feels weird. I feel like a stand-up comic. I'm not going to do that. I'm not trying to be mean. People are at different stages. We're all at different stages. Overflow, we're running a couple hundred a weekend. Joel and the team, man, we're bootstrapping it. He's crushing it. Zeal, we're online right now, so it's like crazy. Central, y'all got the Mercedes Benz of all the campuses. You know, it's awesome. Like, we're all at different levels here. But just are we asking, how are we starting and why are we starting that way? So three, two, one, zero, boom, we're in. We're punching you in the face. Let's go. That's, some churches need that. Some churches, whoa, okay. Like our church is called zeal. That means passion, enthusiasm, excitement. So you better believe nine times out of ten, we're going to kick them in the face with that first note. It's going to be loud. It's going to be fun. I want it loud enough I can't hear myself sing because I can't sing. And if I can hear myself, I'm not going to sing. That's my mentality. There's 90 churches in every city that will turn it down. Only a few will turn it up. And so, like, I'm just, again, who's your audience? What's your why? But when we count down, what do we count down to? Or be intentional. Three, two, one, zero. Quiet, lights out. Welcome to church. Have you prayed today? Jesus. You got everybody's attention in a moment. How are we starting? Why are we starting that way? It's a first impression. And again, if our MO is like family and informal, cool. Three, two, one. Rick Warren in a 
you know, floral shirt. Hey, guys, welcome to Saddleback. Glad you're here. Look at somebody tell them they're looking fine today. You know, like whatever vibe, just are we intentional with it? There's so many different ways we can do it. Here's another thing I wrote when it comes to execution. They get their cue from you. They, the congregation, get their cue from you. So if you, as the worship team, want them to be expressive in their worship at all, you have got to lead that. So that means when you're not on stage, you should be in the front row doing what you want them to do. Does that make sense? If you don't care about that, that's cool too. Like if you want people to sit up front, sit up front. Ah, as a preacher, please sit up front. <laughs> this is the leaders. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you. We are the leaders. And like, that is an empty row up front. Like, do we spit? Like, is that the splash zone? Like, I'm just saying, like, do what you want them to do. Model for it. We, we say all the time, an overflow and zeal in the churches I've been around. The congregation will do 10 to 20 percent or, or exercise 10 to 20 percent of the energy you exude on stage. So if we want people to raise their hands in worship, if we genuinely, and you may not need that or want that at your church, that's okay. I'm not saying we have to do that. I'm just saying if you want people to do this, a worship leader needs to be like, <laughs> like right? That looks insane. But if we're like, Jesus, thank you, we may get some worship Frisbees from our congregation. I mean, then we go, right? So just lead out in what you want them to do. Preachers, not a lot. Some of us don't like response. Totally cool. I get that. If you want response when you're not preaching, give it. Let's go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mitch. Um, not just for our egos. I'm just saying it, create, it wakes people up. It creates an environment. It creates an experience. But they get their cue from you. They get their cue from us. There's no energy in our church. Did you bring energy? <laughs> Here's one. Our church, nobody gives. Are you? <laughs> our church isn't generous. Are you? Generosity is above your tithe, by the way. Tithe is obedience. That's another sermon. Sorry. Sorry, Chris. I'm sorry. That's your territory for today. Come on. Um, I, I told you I got a bunch of these. I'm going to fly. Um, another one I wrote down. What's your wow? On a weekend experience, one thing I had a guy teach me that I loved, he just said, what's your wow? He said, I try and make a wow during worship and a wow during the message. And again, when I say wow, I don't mean you got to drive a motorcycle or a Ferrari on stage. Torin. No, I'm kidding. It was me. That could, but that's an intentional wow. It was Father's Day weekend. I, Father's Day weekend at Central, Craig was nice enough to give me the freedom to get a little creative. And I thought, I thought about that dad who doesn't want to be at church and doesn't love God, but his wife was like, it's Father's Day. We've got to go to church. And he's there, and he hates it. And then all of a sudden, there's a motorcycle on stage. And he's like, well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> like, right? I just wanted that guy to go, okay. You know, like, eh, I wasn't expecting that. Like, just something, right? What's your wow? What's your wow during worship? It could be when Joel holds out that note and it's boom. It could be that cool lighting moment in song two when the stage blacks out and there's the spotlight. It could be when the, it hits zero and it's an acapella old hymn because we haven't sang hymns in forever. Just are we thinking through it or are we just picking four songs? You know, like what's our wow? Preachers. The wow can be you're at the top of ladder, you're driving something on stage. Or I'll tell people all the time, hit your gears. If you're a four to seven on a scale of 10 preaching wise, challenge yourself to hit an eight and challenge yourself to hit a two. So a two would be, I'm like a seven at nine all the time. Y'all know me. I'm like, ah, so like, it's crazy. But what I, one of my favorite things for a while is I'll go. And then Jesus said, he loves you. We're all sitting on the front of the stage, and I'll slow it way down. That can be a wow moment. Oh, he listened. He heard me. Learn your people's names. Use their names in your messages. It's fun. It keeps them awake. They're like, oh, he said my name. <laughs> What's your wow? It doesn't have to be props. doesn't have to be crazy moments. Just are you thinking through that? I love it. At uh, Captivate, they do um, like tweet slides for every speaker. They say, hey, what are your couple like one-liners? And they make sure there's a slide for that. And they're prepared. They prepare in that and they execute in that. Um, here's another one for week in execution that I wrote. Uh, keep announcements short. <laughs> keep announcements short. I put um, two announcements, three max. If you're trying to get people to remember, they're not going to remember more than three things. They're just not. Um, so I, I general rule of thumb that I've learned is two to three announcements goes a long way and say it multiple times in multiple different ways. 
So the slide when they're coming in on the screen, the t-shirt of the greeters say it, all the ushers know the water cooler talk is, Easter's coming up, you coming to Easter, who are we inviting? Then when we get up there, we say it in announcements, we show it in announcements, then it's on the slide deck before service, it's on the slide deck after service. Keep announcements short, keep announcements engaging. Um, there's so many amazing, like, again, just people get up there, don't preach a sermon before the sermon. You ever heard that one? Like, that's just something I would just encourage if you're ever doing announcements. You're like, God gave me a word. He also gave one to your pastor. Um, and so, like, maybe run it by him. Uh, the Holy Spirit's one of order. Um, gosh, this is fun. Y'all don't like me after this. Here's some, here's some sermon advice somebody gave to me that changed the way I preach. Any, any of you guys that write messages when it comes to execution? Um, Ed Young Sr. over there at Second Baptist said, a good preacher will tell you what you need to know. A great preacher will tell you what you need to know and what you need to do. So many times we tell people what scripture says, and then that dude that barely said yes to Jesus or doesn't know him yet go, what does this mean on Monday? Right? Like, what does Mount Sinai have to do with my cubicle tomorrow? Right? What do they need to know? And just challenge yourself as a speaker. What do they need to do? What's the action item here? If they were to walk away, what does that look like at lunch on Sunday or with their spouse on Monday? Here's another one I write. What traditions or elements may be working against you in your weekend experience? And you may not know it. Let me give some examples. Pastor Peter, we already talked about this, so I don't feel bad because um, he's, he's great. Um, here's one I write. Like, um, sometimes like benedictions and communal prayers. Love them. Love them. Love them. But I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm, I'm for them. I'm for them. I'm for them. Some of you, you're looking at me like, eh. But again... Think of the first time guest that doesn't know God. I remember the first time I ever went to a Catholic church. I was fascinated. I went to midnight mass and I loved it. But like four minutes into the, the service, I felt like I didn't get the playbook because everybody knew the signals. Everybody knew when to kneel. Everybody knew when to sit and stand. And I was like, nobody, I was literally just like following everybody. Nobody told me anything. And it was outside of my just arrogance and pride and like my personality, it's really awkward, right? Like I was like, this is fun and I was getting it wrong, but not everybody's like that. So sometimes we think it's cool because we do it all the time and we don't realize we're alienating the exact people we're trying to reach because they don't know the words. They don't know what that means or do our part in educating them on something every week if we're going to do it every week. Here's another one I wrote down. Again, we've all done it. I've been a part of churches that done it, have done it. Um, how about like the kid call up dismissal time during the middle of service? You know what I mean? Like, hey, we started service after the first two songs. We gather all the kids to the foot of the stage. They all sing their song. I love that. If you're a parent, your kid grows up in church, it's like picture moment. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It is great if we weren't trying to reach unchurched people. Because if you show up as a parent and you come in with your child for the first time, and they're like, all the kids go up to the stage. I'm like, oh, no, they're not. I don't know you. I don't know what they're going to do up there. And then all the kids go up, and the kids go, and like, I, should I go with the kids? I don't know. And they're like, no, I don't trust. You don't know the song. Or then they go up, and they're like, I don't know where to stand. What am I doing? And then they just take the kids away. And if you're the parent, you're like, where are they taking my child? <laughs> like, right? Like, that's, so, like, are we unintentionally stiff-arming the very people we're trying to reach by creating these traditions that we love internally, but externally they may not be relevant? Does that make sense? And again, I'm not saying don't do it, but if you're going to do it, explain it. You know, that's, I'm just making sure. Keep those guests in mind. And here's the last one when it comes to execution. I wrote, endings matter. People remember your first impression, and people remember how you made them feel when they leave. Endings matter. Because we've all been a part of it. Joel, you guys have done such a good job at this at Overflow. But like we've all been a part of that church where we hit that last note, God's moving, it's amazing, and then there's no music and somebody walks on stage and goes, wasn't it a good service, everybody? We're glad you were here. A um, couple things to remember on your way out. Um, don't forget, we have the uh, toast gathering on Tuesday. And like you could have preached the best message. It could have been the best worship and you just took all that momentum and energy and went vroom. Preach. Right, oh, I had a nerve, all right, cool. Again, we've all done it. I've done it. And sometimes it's great. Put music under them. If you got to give announcements at the end, make it engaging. Make it fun. Would recommend it. Joel does a great job. We hit that last note. They ring out. They trash can out. And he says, hey, thanks for coming to Overflow. Don't forget part four, summer deep dive next week. We'll see you then. Lights up, music on, walk out. Why do we do that? Always leave them wanting more. If marketing and Disney and all them are good enough to know that, the church, we should be the best at that stuff. 
always leave them wanting more. Like, I even tell our worship leaders sometimes, you know, worship leaders, like, we get in the spirit, and we're like, let's keep going. I'm for it. I'm down. But again, just think about that guest sometimes. And we may want to sing three more choruses, and it could be the right thing to do. But what if we want it, everybody's there, and we go, wrap it up. Wasn't that good, guys? We'll see you next week. And everybody's going, ah, I wanted one more chorus. You better come back. Better come. My favorite thing in preaching, I got three points today. I got three points. I get to point number one. I get to point number two. Oh, guys, I don't have the time for point number three. You got to come back next week. <laughs> it, it, hopefully it's good. And they're like, okay, well, he gave me, I leave them wanting more. Endings matter. And again, I'm not saying you have to do it a certain way. Just think through how are we making them feel when they leave. Y'all vibing with me? We good on that? All right, so that's two of them, and the last couple were really quick. Preparation, execution, distribution. Distribution, what I, what I mean by that is our YouTube, our Instagram. How are we distributing the service after or outside of a Sunday? Even if you don't do online broadcast, you're posting, you're doing something. And I wrote this down when it comes to distribution. The point of it is to remind people of what God did and point to people and point to what God's going to do. Sunday to Sunday, we're there 52 times. So in between, we're reminding people of what God did, and if they missed it, we want them to have FOMO, right? You missed it, and then we're pointing them to what God's about to do. That's what we're doing. Another thing I wrote when it comes to distribution. Often our websites, and specifically today, especially in American context, and Kingston a little bit, um, Instagram is your number one front door. When I go to a city and somebody tells me about a church, I check their Instagram before their website and Google review. I don't know if y'all know that. Like, your website's also, so that's how we distribute what God is doing. Are we intentional? We got live design, in live design. We're all sponsored now. They help us with this. They're amazing. Kathleen, you and your team, Lord, y'all are phenomenal. Let me give them a hand on this. So one of, the, one of the things I learned when it comes to distribution, like marketing one-on-one, I was watching this marketing guru, and he does this. He produces a five-minute video every Monday, a five-minute video every Monday, and then they do this. He gives it to his team. One person on his team transcribes it. Then he takes that transcription and he finds 10 points that he can turn into tweets. So he takes that transcription. Then they divide that five minute video transcription into three parts and it's three blog posts. Again, we're talking distribution. Then they take that video and of course they make a couple short one minute videos for Instagram promos and Facebook promos. And then this, the tweets and the blog posts can also be posted on Facebook. Then they pull stills from that video and put quotes over them for Instagram posts and stories. Out of a five minute video, he says they usually average 40 to 100 pieces of content. Churches, we are producing an hour to an hour and a half of amazing content every weekend. How are we distributing it? Here's some life hacks. Go on Fiverr, you can pay somebody 20 bucks to transcribe your sermon. Get an intern to read through it and find five good quotes and the scriptures. There you got 10 tweets and you got 10 stories on Instagram in a matter of 15 minutes and 20 bucks. Like just are we thinking through distribution, practical distribution methods, why we're doing it, what we're doing. The last thing I wrote down when it comes to distribution is photography matters. Social media engagement tip, faces 80% of the time, graphics 20% of the time. If you want people to engage and like it on your social media and what they're seeing from the church, let them see people. Not text. We want to connect with people, not a graphic. Graphics are cool. I'm for them. They're great. Again, shout out LD. But people matter. We want to connect with people. And then I wrote this down. We got preparation when it comes to weekend experience, execution, distribution, and evaluation. If we don't evaluate it, how do we expect it to get better? If you grew up playing sports, you know about game film. We would practice all weekend football. We would beat each other up, throwing a dead pig around, 18 year olds, you know? And then on Saturday morning, no one paid us. We would show up to the locker room and we would go over every mistake in detail. Why? So we could carry and throw a dead pig around better. No consequences in eternity at all. Are we evaluating our experience? You wanna talk about excruciating? Take your online, record your worship team, dry, no reverb, no nothing, and then go back and watch it with the worship team and let them see Joel's like, no, no, don't do that, no. It will make you so much better. You feel like you're doing this, and you watch, and you're doing this. Right? 
watching it, and we'll laugh together. Again, laugh, it's okay. I'm not saying pick at each other, but be secure and evaluate. Take a picture of the guest services experience, and then share it with the guest services team. Hey, how does this look? That looks awesome, evaluate it. Another thing I wrote when it comes down to evaluation is uh, terminology matters. We say, um, instead of like pros and cons or pass and fail, we say grows and glows. Grows and glows. Hey, this last Sunday, let's talk grows and glows. What are the glowing areas? What are the areas that were amazing? Who are we shouting out? Will and Kids Ministry crushed it. Yeah, Will, that was great. We had this volunteer. She was amazing. We need to look to raise her up. Man, that new vocalist was amazing. How we get them in the rotation more? Like, grow, like glows, glows, glows. But then grows. What are areas of growth? What are areas that we need to see improvement? Um, apartment life where my wife works, they call it evidence of God's grace. Where, where were the evidence of God's grace? In other words, we didn't hit the mark, but God still moved. So how can, we, how can we get better in these areas? And then the last thing when it comes to evaluation, I wrote, remember to celebrate. Remember to celebrate. So many times we can get caught up in all the logistics and preparation and, and then evaluation. Sometimes people can it, can, it can be touchy and all that. But one of my favorite things that I'm learning to get better and better at and trying to get better at is like as God's people, man, we're supposed to be the most joy-filled people on the planet. I mean, gosh, look what we get to be a part of. Look what we get to do. This is insane, guys. Don't forget to celebrate. When somebody does something good, yeah, that's why we amen when people say good things, right? Because it's like, that's good. You're doing what God wants you to do, <laughs> right? Celebrate people. They need it. They need it. Oh, God, do they need it. Monday through Friday, you have no idea what they're going through. You have no idea the crap they're taking from their boss. You have no idea what's going on in their marriages. You have no idea what they're going through. And for a Sunday to be a place where you're happy to see them and you let them know it. When they do something good, you're like, dude, that was amazing. People need it. Let's be a place that celebrates. And to finish out this talk on Weekend Experience, guys, I just want to celebrate what God's doing. Guys, look what we get to be a part of. I couldn't even remember all the church names. Two years ago, there was like five of us, six of us. Like, we're almost doubling in size. Like, Ukraine, we're talking about bringing three more into the Water's Edge network in the next few months. Internationally, we have two more in the pipeline. Domestically, Pastor Craig was telling me a church was trying to pay to get in the network. He said no. I said, why? Did you say no? <laughs> and let's celebrate what God is doing, because this is a special thing. That's all I have for you guys today. Let me pray, and I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Travis. God, thank you that we get to experience you, Jesus. Oh, man. It's not a football game. It's not a concert. It's not a beauty pageant. It's literally connecting with the family and presence of God. Thank you that we get to do this. God, I pray anything that I said that wasn't for a specific church, that it would just wash away like water off a duck's back. God, but I pray that as we went through this, you would have brought clarity to the pastors and the teams here of how we can experience and be intentional in stepping into more of your presence, God, and helping people do that. Father, thank you that we get to do that in Indonesia, in Cambodia, in Nigeria, in Ukraine, in the U.S., in California, in Michigan, in Tennessee, in Florida. Jesus, thank you that we get to be a part of this. And Father, thank you that we're a part of something really fun and we get to celebrate. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's amazing.